must we credit these strange accounts of rebellious materializations, phantoms which have become real beings, or must we reject them all as mere fantastic tales and wild products of imagination? Perhaps the latter course is the wisest. I affirm nothing. I only relate what I have heard from people whom, in other circumstances, I had found trustworthy. But they may have deluded themselves in all sincerity. Alexandra David Neal The tulpa is a term that has only become mainstream online extremely recently. It is a concept and a creature that has its roots in the ancient beliefs of Buddhism and Hinduism, and has been influenced by many cultures. Many think of it as purely paranormal, or even a demonic creature. But how accurate is that description? What is the tulpa really? The answer may surprise you. Find out tonight on this hallucinogenic episode of Snipe Hunt. Hello! This is Snipe Hunt, your frightening folklore podcast. Thank you for manifesting into tonight's episode. I am your literal and spiritual guide, Gary Clevenstein. And I am just a voice thought formed into existence, who is also your host, Darren Young. And as always, we have an interesting episode for you guys tonight. Um, One that not only delves into ancient practices and beliefs, but reaches deep into the modern internet culture as well. We are discussing a topic often mentioned in various other discussions of the paranormal, thought forms, otherwise known as tulpas. We always say tonight on this episode, but it's actually pretty early on a Sunday morning. (laughs) I'm still waking up. I've got my coffee. Um, So hopefully that helps. But if we sound bored or monotone, just because... Well, you stayed up super late last night, didn't you? Right, yes. I, I try to go to bed at a reasonable hour, so maybe we'll get through this, but maybe yeah, not. Yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> we'll do it. It's fine. We'll make it work. We'll make it work. All right. So I chose this topic for a reason. Um, it's often mentioned among other paranormal circles, but not really elaborated on. So let's fix that, shall we? So just so we're on the same page, what exactly is a tulpa? Or at least, what is the definition as we know it today? Well, Darren... The modern definition of a tulpa is the same as a thought form, which authors Natasha Michaels and Joseph Laycock described in simple terms. A tulpa is a being that begins in the imagination but acquires a tangible reality and sentience. Tulpas are created either through a deliberate act of individual will or unintentionally from the thoughts of numerous people. So basically, it's an imaginary friend that has its own sentience that word does me in, uh, separate from its creators and actual exists in some shape or form. But as you're about to discover, it's a lot more complicated than that, and the definition might just be totally incorrect. Let's jump into the history of this entity. Yeah, the whole kind of concept is uh, it's uh, complicated, to put it simply, if that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> All right, so. Never heard uh, of it. Yeah, yeah, well, you're going to learn today. And do some learning. <laughs> uh, so many sources claim that tulpas originate in Buddhism, particularly Tibetan Buddhism, and they are only partially correct because the reality is a lot less clear cut. Tulpas, as we know them today, are more of a mishmash of concepts from both Tibetan Buddhism and Western esoter Western esotericism. Yeah, (laughs) due to the influence of Western Orientalists and the translation of these Buddhist concepts by translators. Um, So the earliest written mention of tulpas are relatively recent, appearing in Magic and Mystery in Tibet by Alexandra David Neal in 1929, where she described them as phantoms. The author also stated that tulpas were related to tolkus, which she described as, quote, Forms created by magic. So, what's a tulku, you may ask? Well, buckle up, because I'm about to throw a bunch of confusing terms at you, and I'm going to mispronounce every single one of them. So, originally, the tulku was a Buddhist translation of the Sanskrit Nirmankaya, Nirmankaya, which is one of the three bodies of Buddha. The three bodies of the Buddha, 
of the booty. <laughs> Tell pretty- me you did that. Tell me you did that on purpose. I did. <laughs> <laughs> God, I wish I did. Uh, I can't write that. I can't write that. The booty. <laughs> oh man, I just hit my mic. This is going well. Okay, the three bodies of the Buddha is from the Trikaya doctrine, which I just mentioned. Uh, states that booty. <laughs> God, <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we know it's on your mind, dude. Why? God dang. It's, First thing in the morning. It's too early, man. <laughs> it's too early. God. Okay, the Trikaya doctrine states that a Buddha has three bodies <laughs> or manifestations. I wonder if one of them bodies is a booty. <laughs> well, okay. let's go through them. All right. Find okay. out. We have the Dharmakaya, the truth body, which embodies the very principle of enlightenment and knows no limits or boundaries. The Sambhogakaya. Uh, which is the body of mutual enjoyment, which is a body of bliss or clear light manifestation. That that must be the booty. Uh, <laughs> and then we have the aforementioned Nirmankaya, aka Tolku, the emanation or created body, which manifests in time and space. Created body being the key phrase here. And remember, we don't expect you to remember any of this. We just wanted to be accurate in presenting the origins of the Tulpa concept. Yeah, there's going to be no quiz, so don't worry. Yeah. Before we move on, I should note that the meaning of the term Tolku is now used to refer to specific lineages of reincarnations of important spiritual leaders, and that, that's just putting it simply. A good example of a Tolku, Tolku lineage is that of the Dalai Lama, the spiritual leader of the Tibetan people. So, aka, the spirit of the Dalai Lama is reincarnated into the next Dalai Lama, even though that Dalai Lama is a different person, if that makes sense. One Buddhist text describes another sort of emanation body, a mind-made body. The text, whew, man, the text Samana Fala Sutta. Very good. Thank you. I'm sure that's totally wrong. Explains that one is able to gain this ability as one of the fruits of following the Buddhist path or the Buddhist path, and describes it as such. Now a monk creates another body from this one, mind made, with all its limbs and faculties. It is just as though a man were to draw a sword out of its scabbard. He might think, this is a sword. This is the scabbard. The sword and the scabbard are different, but the sword was drawn from the scabbard. In just the same way, the monk creates another body from this one, mind made with all its limbs and faculties. Hmm. Yeah. So are you starting to get an idea? I get, I'm get. i starting to get it now, yes. How it's kind of like a, it's a spirit that's created from the body, but separate from the body and eventually has its own sentience, which has its own thoughts and feelings separate yeah. from yours. So it almost becomes a totally separate. A entity. super easy clone. Yes, pretty much. Yeah. Well, it's not exactly a clone because it it would be different from you. All if right. that makes sense. So, well, let's continue on so you can get a more of an idea of it. Um so back to author and spiritualist Alexander David Neal, in her book, she admitted that the definitions of tolpa and tolku in her times were murky at best. Um she described the difference as tolpas being created by magicians while tolku tolkus are aspects of Buddhas and has a more significant spiritual meaning. Now, David Neal claimed to have observed the mystical art of creating a tulpa in Tibet, and so she created her own tulpa using, quote, concentration of thought and other rites, end quote. Also in her book, she explained her understanding of, of this as being as such, quote, once the topa is endowed with enough vitality to be capable of playing the part of a real being, it tends to free itself from its maker's control. This, say, Tibetan occultists, happens nearly mechanically, just as the child, when his body is completed and able to live apart, leaves its mother's womb. End quote. And so the metaphorical child left David Neal's metaphorical womb, and her creation was metaphorically born. She even created her tulpa in the form of a jolly Friar Tuck-esque Western monk in order to distinguish it from the Tibetan deities. Uh, More on her tulpa later. Now Alexander David Neal practiced theosophy, 
which is kind of difficult to summarize, but essentially it was a religion or philosophy founded by famed occultist Madame Blavatsky in the 19th century, which drew from both European philosophy, Christianity, and Eastern religions like Buddhism and Hinduism. Also rooted in Western occultism is the entity known as a thought form, as elaborated by occultist William Walker Atkinson in his book, Clairvoyance and Occult Powers. He claimed that experienced practitioners of the occult can produce thought forms from their auras that serves as astral projections, as illusions, that can only be seen by those with, quote, awakened astral senses. So Alexander's definition of a tulpa was most likely influenced by her theosophic background and the concept of thought forms, considering the thought form idea was written, at least written down before the concept of a tulpa, so uh, may have heavily influenced it, and combined that concept with others from Eastern beliefs, such as the tolku and the Buddha emanation bodies, and the mind-made bodies, as described in other Buddhist texts. So, you know, the tulpa as we know it today draws from like a dozen different sources at least. So ultimately, it seems the tulpa is actually a Western theosophic creation heavily inspired by various concepts of Buddhism. Modern day tulpa enthusiasts claim the entire concept comes from Tibetan beliefs, but that only seems to be partially correct. The main difference between all these from a tulpa is that a tulpa is the only one that can gain sentience separate from the creator. So a thought form, a mind body, and even a tolku, they don't really gain their own sentience. They kind of just do as their creator wills, whereas a tulpa, you know, can even say... It does its own thing. Yeah, it does its own thing. Exactly, exactly. Well, so now we're going to talk about the modern day tulpamancy. I like that word, tulpamancy. It's a fun word. Yes. And, well, I, I'm glad you like it because we're going to be saying it a lot. <laughs> yeah, for. Well, hopefully it rolls off the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now that we have a relatively deep understanding of what, of what a tulpa is and the history behind it, let's get to tulpas in the modern day. Let's do it. The concept of tulpas was popularized in the United States through fiction, mainly introduced via television in the late 1990s and 2000s. But starting in 2009, online communities dedicated to tulpas spawned on the 4chan and Reddit websites, and they started to take the concept seriously. All right. So that kind of had the same birth as like a uh, Slenderman and type stuff. Okay. Yes. Actually, I, I didn't really include them in this episode, but there have have been arguments that Slenderman is Tulpa like. Uh, it okay. makes any sense, but we'll get to that here in a minute. Yeah, they formed a new definition of a Tulpa, dubbed the practice of creating and or keeping a Tulpa, Tulpamancy, and called themselves Tulpamancers. Tulpamancers. Yeah. <laughs> a very informative site, Tulpa.io, was created by a Tulpamancer named Sam I say this. I I say this. I don't. I don't, I don't even know. Yeah. I S A T I S. Yeah. I Which always li- said Isadis, but no, Isadis. That's, that's probably right. <laughs> I don't know. Which lists the following definition for the modern day tulpa. A tulpa is an autonomous entity existing within the brain of a host. They are distinct from the host in that they possess their own personality, opinions, and actions, which are independent of the hosts, and are conscious entities in that the they possess awareness of themselves and the world. A fully formed tulpa is, or highly resembles, to an indistinguishable point, an actual other sentient, sapient being cohabitating with the host consciousness. Uh, the author goes on to say that the tulpamancy falls under the concept of plurality, a phenomenon which multiple consciences inhabit one brain. But most Tulpamancers do not think of the practice as having to do with anything supernatural. Here's an excerpt from Samuel Vissieri's Varieties of Tulpa Experience to elaborate. Uh, yeah, that's that's probably a good, pretty good pronunciation of his last name. Yeah? But yeah. I, I was pretty proud of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I might call it Vissier or something, whatever, <laughs> later Vissier. on when we quote yeah, him again, right. but whatever. Yeah, um, go ahead. That, that sounds better anyways. So he says uh, that the community is primarily divided between so-called psychological and metaphysical explanatory principles. 
In the psychological community, neuroscience, or folk neuroscience, is the explanation of choice. Tulpas are understood as mental constructs that have achieved sentience. The metaphysical explanation holds that tulpas are agents of supernatural origins that exist outside the host's minds, who come to communicate with them. Of 118 respondents queried on the question, 76.5 identified with a psychological explanation, 8.5 with the metaphysical, and 14% with a variety of other explanations, such as a mixture of psychological and metaphysical, end quote. Uh, so in my research into the Tulpa Reddit community, I found this to be pretty true. Um, some members of the forum actually got very defensive when they saw that I was researching for a paranormal podcast because they wanted the practice to be taken seriously as a psychological tool and did not want it to be sensationalized as anything paranormal. But yeah, I went on there and I was like, I went to the Tulpa subreddit. And I was like, hey, I'm researching into it. I didn't say I was researching for my podcast, but considering my username is Snipe Hunt Podcast, <laughs> they, <laughs> they figured it out pretty quickly and they posted a link to my podcast. They're like, oh, look at these titles. They speak for themselves. Quite a few of them didn't want to talk to me, but luckily one didn't. <laughs> so, you know, what? I'm proud of you for uh, even knowing how to use Reddit. I can't figure it out. Yeah, I, it took me a little bit. It's not, it's not terrible. It's just, kind of awkward it's not like it's not like necessarily a social media site it's more like just a collection of forums and then yeah i know but i don't even know how to comment and i don't uh, even know how to, I well, don't to do any of that yeah, i mean i know you, i'm sure on the phone it probably says comment but the way that it lays it out for you like i know like i get the, you i get like you. the slash r i don't i just don't get it but anyway well the slash r is just the subreddit it doesn't mean anything <laughs> <laughs> uh so for example i went to slash r tulpas um oh. okay so they didn't want to sensationalize as anything paranormal now that we've made that distinction keep in mind that we might poke a little fun at this anyway because we like to think of this as a comedy podcast and this is an unusual topic we are in no way judging or trying to offend anyone and i apologize in advance if you feel like we do please email us if you feel like we do <laughs> yes uh and i wanted to just stress this as i have a feeling that they're going to be listening to this episode um okay now that that's out of the way you know, hopefully one or two of them do, you know. I'm sure they will. I know at least one will, at least my informants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so before we jump in, we need to go over a couple of definitions of certain subcultures. These are terms I am sure at least some listening are familiar with, but we'll define them for those who are fortunately uninformed. <laughs> yeah. Like myself, we at Snipe Hunt are sorry to be the ones to break this to you. If in fact this is your first time hearing about these. Okay, so term number one is fandom. A fandom is basically a group of people who share the same interests, usually that of a TV show, movie, or even a sport. For example, I like Star Wars, so I might be considered a member of the Star Wars fandom. Although true fandom usually goes deeper than that, sometimes to the point of fanaticism, and most members are highly involved with other members of the community. That was the easy one. And like, I am not part of the Star Wars fandom, but that's just me. You're missing out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, number two is a brony. A brony is an adult male who belongs to the My Little Pony. Friendship is magic fandom. Yes. Oh, that's disturbing. <laughs> uh, a brony is oftentimes not only just a fan of the show, but can be obsessed. And what's uh, term number three, Gary? <laughs> term number three is a furry a furry is a member of the furry fandom which is a subculture interested in anthropomorphic animal characters with human personalities and characteristics most furries have a fursona which are fictional anthropomorphic anthropomorphic <laughs> yes pomorphic animal characters created by fans Furries will often roleplay online with other furries as their fursonas. Furries who saved up enough money will sometimes drop as much as $3,000 on a costume that resembles their fursona and will attend events or conventions just as their original character. Now, the other day I told, um, I told Darren, I was, <laughs> we were playing a, I was a game. I going to bring that up. <laughs> we were playing a game on PS4 and I put this like, uh, it was like a, it was like a, a wolf colorful, hat. It was like a pink wolf hat. Yeah, I put it over my character, and 
Darren's like, oh God, please, no, no furry stuff. <laughs> yeah, please. And I'm thinking, I think it looks cool. <laughs> and anyways. now uh, we're, we won't get into it, but members of both the Brony and furry fandom often get a bad rap. And um, for what I've seen online through various meme websites that, you know, I, they, <laughs> they kind of deserve it to a certain extent. I'm sure not all are like that, <laughs> but definitely a, a good number of loud voices online are. But moving on. Uh, side note, we do call these subcultures, but as my psychology grad student girlfriend pointed out, they are technically neo tribes, <laughs> um, as they are just groups of people who come together for shared interests. Hmm. I just want to, I just wanted to point that out because I was telling her about it and she's like, oh, actually, I think they're neo tribes. And then she looked it up and she's like, see, they are. I was like, well, might as well throw that in there. <laughs> I wonder what that means. Every when they throw the word neo in front of it, like you always it's hear new. neo, like, like it means new. Oh, does it? Yes. So, like, when you say neo-Nazi, yes. that's just the new Modern Nazis. day Nazi. This is oh, what I mean. look yeah. how stupid I am. Okay. <laughs> uh, now we define all these neo-tribes for a good reason. They are essentially the originators of the modern day topomancy practice. The Bronies in particular were among the first of these communities to discuss and practice topomancy. Members experimented with creating their own topos, particularly ones that resembled characters in the My Little Pony animated series, and would document and discuss their experiences on 4chan discussion boards, Reddit forums. I was to say, just maybe in my in my judgmental mind, I try not to be. Yeah, it, it's that just sounds hard. very. It just sounds very kid diddlish to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, considering all, it could be wrong on this, but I think. All of the characters in that show are on the like they're considered children in their world, so no. maybe. But, okay. but yeah, I was going through a bunch of forums, and uh, literally, I was like, "Hey, I should look for some, you know, real entries into this." And literally, the first one I found, he posted pictures of his tulpa, and it was of that. It was literally just a My Little Pony. <laughs> wow! Well, <laughs> I'm just. I was like, all right, just, all right. Sure. Well, then I'm trying to remember, like my my. F- my daughter got me a face mask for, you know, cause you know, that's yeah. how we roll these days and uh, it's SpongeBob. So like you put it on and it looks like the bottom half of your face is SpongeBob. Oh, that's cool. So like, so like <laughs> to some people that might, you know, as an adult male wearing that, you know, they might, cause that's a kid's show, you know? So like, why the hell are you wearing? Yeah. But there's so, not a community, you know, based around watching SpongeBob and, you know, over sexualizing SpongeBob either. So I think it's a little was, bit better. Than my oh, it, this is sexualized. Oh yes, I'm like oh. I was trying to hint at that earlier, but it's, oh yeah. well, I know furries are. The, I, yeah, I didn't know that the bronies are too as well. Brony. Oh, not okay. all, not all bronies. I want to specify that I don't want any hate mail. <laughs> I mean, maybe a little bit would be fine, but so yeah. I want to specify that not all bronies, but uh, a, a a loud voice on the internet is. Gotcha. But, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, the furry fandom was also quick to pounce on the Tulpa phenomenon. Creating original characters and developing characteristics into a fursona was already their forte. So the idea of creating a manifestation of an anthropomorphic animal with their minds must have been super alluring. I'm sorry, I kind of cleared my throat right in the middle of your reading. Um, oh, <laughs> uh, so side notes, I kind of just mentioned this, but we are in no way saying that all Tulpa mancers or furries or bronies, nor are we saying that all furries or bronies are tulpamancers. I am saying that these communities were what jump started tulpamancy within online forums. The r slash tulpa subreddit alone has 33,000 plus members, which is a lot, and is very active with questions about tulpas as well as tulpa experiences. I'm going to have to dive into that hole one day, one night and just go oh, crazy. It's, it's super interesting. Like, when I first went into this, I was like, yeah, I'm, this might have been, should have been a mini episode. I don't think I'm going to be able to <laughs> enough, but here we are. And that's one, as far as show notes, it's one of our longest. So, yeah. All right. So how does one create a Tulpa? Well, Alexandra David Neal, the you know lady from the 1900s who first wrote about the sensation, was extremely vague about her process, only mentioning intense concentration and the ambiguous other rights. It supposedly took months for her illusory companion to form. Let's return to modern day tulpas. How does someone create this entity today? 
There's no specific way, and there are literally hundreds of guides and materials you can find and go through in order to do this. But this morning, <laughs> we'll <be nice>. <laughs> <laughs> whatever time you're listening to this, we will be using Thunderclap's guide for Tulpa creation. I love Thunderclap. That's what I named my thighs. <laughs> um, there are many other ways to do this, and there are Tulpa mancers with different viewpoints than this. But this method is great for giving the basic idea of the concept. The guide consists of four phases, personality, visualization, narration, and imposition. But first, we must talk about the Wonderland, which Thunderclap explains as a mental world or dreamscape that people craft as environments to topo force in. The main idea surrounding it is that it is an area that you are comfortable and relaxed in, making it easier to focus on your topo. A wonderland also can serve as a home for your topo and provides an environment for you to spend time with and partake in imaginary activities with them. This can be anything from bike riding and scuba diving to cave spelunking and skydiving. The choice is entirely up to you. So essentially, it's a mental uh, space for which you can interact with your tulpa in. Yeah, it's a it's a mental theme park for you and your. Well, it can be a theme park. It can also be a forest. It can also be whatever you want. I'm wondering if the word fetish would be an insult. Probably. <laughs> I wonder if that'd be that'd be insulting, like to call these a fetish. Well. Mm. I think I think the word fetish has a lot of negative connotations to it. Yeah, it does. I would go and say yes. Um, that might be. Well, I mean, like, well, like if we talk about Jeremy, you know, uh, I would say <laughs> that Jeremy has a like an anime fetish, but it's not. I wouldn't say that. Well, he loves anime. I just think it's like he doesn't like, love anime. He's well, he doesn't love anime in like as much as you know other people do. He's I like, have a video game fetish. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. The correct use of the term. <laughs> Whatever. <Okay>. Um, <laughs> Moving on. But, the, but it does not seem that a wonderland is necessary for creating and or maintaining a tulpa. Uh, so also we'll be referring to Thunderclap as he, even though we do not know what gender this tulpa mancer is. All right, let's get started. Yeah, Thunderclap could very well be a woman. That's true. The first phase of tulpa creation is personality. This is simply establishing a personality for your tulpa, their likes and dislikes, mannerism, traits, etc. Mannerisms. That's what I said. You said mannerisms. Manure. Well, mannerism. Like I always say <laughs> mannerism. I say mannerisms. I must be wrong. Okay. Well, you're confusing so, with aneurysm, which is a medical well, condition. I know. I know. Man, mannerisms. Okay. Yeah. Traits, etc. Thunderclap's method is to write down a list of traits and read them to his tulpa. He imagines a ball of energy representing his tulpa and imagines each trait as a ball of energy. Then he imagines the tulpa absorbing the personality ball. He also says you can use whatever symbolism works best for you. As of late, more and more tulpa mancers are letting their tulpa pick their own personality traits as it gives them more of a choice and develops more naturally. Yes. So the next phase is narration. This is simply interacting with your tulpa. Mainly by just talking to them. Thunderclap says when you interact with your tulpa, you're essentially feeding them energy with attention and building them to become more solid. He mentions what he calls passive forcing, which is just casually talking with your tulpa while doing another activity, like watching TV or homework, or like if you're playing video games, you're like, oh man, Bob, <laughs> <laughs> did you see that kill? This BS, man. Uh I'm sick. (laughs) With enough narration, the tulpa will start to reciprocate communication. At first, it may start with a, quote, alien feeling or an emotional response. The alien feeling is a physical response to the presence of a tulpa. An example Thunderclap gives, and this is a very common one I found, is a head pressure like a painless headache. Uh, Eventually, the tulpa will start to talk back. At first, it may just sound like your own voice in your head. But the tulpa will develop its own voice over time. Hmm. I feel like we're oh, never mind. No, what, what were you right. gonna say? What were you gonna say? I was just gonna that whole that whole paragraph just it felt like I was on the outside looking in at somebody just losing their 
ever loving mind. Well, we'll we 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 do talk about the psychology of it later on. Right. So we'll okay. get to that. Right. We'll get to that. All right. <laughs> the third phase is visualization. At this point, it's time to visualize what your topa actually looks like. A topa's form can be just about anything. It can look like a human or an animal or anything else. Thunderclap visualizes by interacting with them in a very human way, as opposed to imagining them suspended in midair. But once again, he emphasizes that you can do this in any way that works best for you. He visualizes his topa by interacting with them in Wonderland as opposed to the physical world. He says that if you're having trouble visualizing your tulpa as a whole, but try imagining uh, only a part at a time. Yeah. Thunderclap does not mention this, but some sources say that tulpas choose their own forms as opposed to one being chosen for them. But it seems that it depends on the tulpa. And then the last phase is imposition, which is imposing your tulpa in the physical world. Thunderclap says that the tulpa is not there physically, but rather appears as a hallucination. At this point, you should be able to perfectly visualize your tulpa, and your tulpa should be talking to you. This is the phase that takes the longest amount of time. This phase involves connecting with your tulpa with all five senses. Most start this process by focusing on a flat surface and imagining the tulpa being there. When fully imposed, you should be able to see, smell, hear, touch, and even taste your tulpa. <laughs> Uh, you should be able to reach out and feel the texture, other skin, or clothes. Although it seems that many Tulpamancers do not take it this far, but many do. Uh, Thunderclap mentions that it's still a hallucination, and this is simply the process of tricking your mind into believing that it is interacting with a physical object. This is the most difficult phase to master. Wait, wait a minute. Let me, let me ask this. Well, we're we're probably going to get to whatever you're about to question. No, no, I don't think we are. Yes, we are. Okay. Is this a, is this a uh, imaginary friend? Yes. Tulpas are essentially imaginary friends, but putting saying calling it an imaginary friend is incorrect because imaginary friend is just that imaginary, whereas tulpas take on a more the best term I found for it was tangible reality because they're still only within your head. Um, at least for the psychological school of Tulpamancy, but they're real to the point where you can interact with them and they have a sentience separate from yours. (laughs) Yeah, kind of a weird concept, which is why I wanted to cover it. Uh, Many Tulpamancers even create multiple Tulpas to interact with. Um, One Tulpamancer I talked to knew someone with over 20 Tulpas, um, but they did not advocate having that many tulpas because yeah. <laughs> uh, it's got to be mentally exhausting. Yeah, exactly. Uh, these tulpas can also interact with other tulpas from the same creator. There are many reasons why people may create a tulpa. Many tulpa mancers, uh, I would say the vast majority, cite loneliness and a yearning uh, for companionship as a reason. I talked with a tulpa mancer on Reddit. This is my informant I was talking about. They were under the username, leave the doors open, who put it this way. I think a lot of people who make tulpas unintentionally make them as a coping mechanism. I've talked to a therapist about my tulpas before, and she agreed with that statement as well. Said she'd seen it more than once. I think even if you don't have trauma in your life, tulpas can be a good coping mechanism. Many people I see on the subreddit say that they want a tulpa because they're lonely, or they like the idea of a companion and to be there through everything life has to offer, or they want another opinion when they come across problems. I think seeking that connection in of, of itself is a way of coping, but I feel that way about any relationship. People want lovers, or friends, or familial bonds as a way to cope with loneliness and the struggles of life, to have someone with them. So I don't think most of them look at it as a matter of finding a way to cope with things, just that they want a friend. Yeah, so it's just like uh, as humans, we're very social creatures and, you know, we always crave friendship or companionship of some sort. Um, so this is just another aspect of that, essentially. I should note that leave the doors open to mention coping in that explanation so much uh, as the user was answering my question about whether people might create a tulpa as a coping mechanism to fill a void for companionship. So that's why he said coping so many times. Leave the Doors Open also mentioned that it's not only about coping, 
though, as some tulpas have no interest in the creator's issues. So that you like try to talk to them like, man, I had a problem today. Tulpas are like, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> did, did you ever, do you know how old this person is? This leave the I doors do open? Oh, okay. All right. Because to me, it just seems like it'd be, it'd be easier to wrap my head around if they were like in their late teens, early 20s. But I just can't imagine like a, a 40, 50 year old. So let, let me say this, that one I mentioned earlier about having a literal, my little pony Tulpa, they uh-huh. claimed to be married and like 51 years old. But I was like, yeah, oh, wow. I got that. Um, so one of my, one of the sources I cite on here, but not this exact one says that most Tulpa mancers are within the teenager to early twenties range. So if that gives you an idea, right. Leave the Doors Open wanted to emphasize that tulpas, although being a psychological manifestation, are still their own people. They have their own thoughts, emotions, and opinions outside of their creator. Some tulpas will even leave their creator either temporarily or forever if they want to. Now at this point, you may be wondering that if a tulpa has a will separate from their creator and a tangible presence in the creator's mind, is it possible for a tulpa to turn on and hurt or even kill its creator? The answer is no. Does not seem to be the case, at least for those uh, in the psychological tulpa camp. A tulpa seems to always be a positive influence in the user's life. A relationship with a tulpa is just like any other relationship. Communication is key. Leave the doors open, put it this way. Quote, as for any tips, communicate, communicate, communicate. Remember that you're a team. Like in every relationship in life, The most important thing is keeping strong lines of communication open to make sure everyone has their needs met. My advice is always ask, talk, discuss it. The way you run your system, the setup you have with each other, there's no right or wrong way to do it as long as you're all happy and working together on having a good life and being the people you want to be, end quote. Yeah, I mean, if it's uh, adding a positive addition to your life and making you happy, then... absolutely. And there's actually some more uh, tangible positive influences, which we'll get to later. Yeah. When should you not create a tulpa? That's what many of you are wondering right now. <laughs> Thunderclap says that it's possible to create a tulpa for the wrong reasons, although creating one for these reasons are rare. Do not create a tulpa if you are only fulfilling sexual desires. That was going to be why I would create one. <laughs> But now I will not. (laughs) I will not. All right. Sorry. Uh, To let frustration out on. To abuse. For their form to only have around just for the sake of looking at them. That's awkward. Yeah. Just to stare Uh, at them. Yeah. So that's why you don't do it for that. Because it's awkward. (laughs) (laughs) Or if you just plan on getting rid of them later. Yeah. So getting rid of them, you can, uh, I tried, I asked, I leave the doors open. Like, what does it mean to get, like, get rid of, like, do you dismiss it? It's he described or he or she described it as like, uh, abandoning them or just forgetting about them completely. So I don't know. It's the whole thing's kind of confusing, obviously. (laughs) Now this inevitably, inevitably, this inevitably leads to the question, can a Tulpa be a sexual partner? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we, anything, we had to, we had to touch on this there's no anything can be a, anything <laughs> can be a sexual partner in your head come on okay uh, sorry uh it should be noted that this is a controversial question within the community and for the most part a sexual relationship with a tulpa is taboo consent is also a very important part as a tulpa is its own separate entity with its own preference and desires but if you have mastered the imposition phase, and if your tulpa consents, then sure. But other tulpa answers may look down on you for it. So just don't tell them you're banging <laughs> your tulpa. <laughs> as we just mentioned, that could indicate the creation of a tulpa for the wrong reason. And as we mentioned earlier, the community wants to be normalized in society, and this kind of behavior may inhibit that. We just had to touch on it. There's no getting around it. <laughs> All right, now that we've been throwing around the term psychological a lot, let's get into the psychology of tulpamancy. Let's do it. Now, inventing a new personality to the point of it being considered a separate person in the mind may sound like something akin to disassociative identity disorder, disorder, formerly known as multiple personality disorder. And, of course, they had to make it more difficult to say, Uh, especially when it comes to the concept of plurality. And especially when it comes to possession or switching in which the tulpamancers allow their tulpa control of the body. 
And some think that topomancy is just that. Self-induced did. D-I-D. Did. <laughs> D-I-D. Self-induced disassociative identity disorder. Yes. Yes. But that is not the case, as actual DID cannot be self-induced and is characterized by loss of time, extreme forgetfulness, loss of sense of self and consciousness, none of which is reported within Tolpomancy. The practice does not meet the criteria for DID as defined in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Yeah, so it's not like the guy off Split, where it's just like a bunch of different <laughs> yeah. personalities inhabiting one body. So it's an important ex- distinction to make. Um, having a tulpa is not indicative of a mental disorder in itself, as it does not meet the criteria for that either, which are significant distress, dysfunction, or danger as a result of deviant behavior. It's actually quite the opposite. The majority of tulpa mancers have reported a positive change in their lives after creating a tulpa particularly their social lives. Even topomancers with existing mental conditions have reported positive changes as reported by Samuel Vessier. I don't, I don't know his name. Vessier! But it's uh, Samuel V-E-I-S-S-I-E-R-E. So if you're interested in the psychology behind it, definitely go refer to his article. It's actually really interesting. He says... A subsequent survey was designed to target tulpamancers who had been diagnosed with or identified with mental illnesses or DSM-type psychopathologies. The most common conditions, as reported by respondents, excluding social anxiety, were, in order of frequency, Asperger's syndrome, 25%, attention deficit disorders, 21.4%, general anxiety, 17.8%, depression, 14.4% and obsessive compulsive disorder, 10.7%. Keep in mind, these aren't percentages of the community as a whole, but as the percentage of those who responded who already had mental disorders of some sort. The survey revealed a similar trend of overall reported improvement. 93.7% of respondents expressed that taking up topomancy had made their condition better. 54.5% of the respondents who identified with Asperger's or Autism Spectrum Disorder claimed their ability to read physical humans had improved with tulpamancy, while 45.5% reported being unsure about the changes in mind reading, despite overall positive changes in their social lives. End quote. So basically, it's helping those, especially those with existing uh, social disorders, to improve socially. Like, especially those on the autism spectrum, which is a social disorder, they have trouble interacting normally with other human beings. So taking up tulpamancy has actually helped them improve that, which I thought was interesting. Seems pretty positive. Yeah. Um, And not the guy from Split. (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) uh, So time for tulpa stories. Yeah, I like stories. Yay. We'll start with the OG, Alexandra David Neal. I should remind everyone that she believed tulpas were a paranormal or metaphysical phenomenon, which is contrary to what mo- most modern day tulpa mancers believe. This is an excerpt from Body, Mind, and Spirits, a dictionary of New Age ideas. David Neal's tulpa began its existence as a plump, benign little monk, similar to Friar Tuck. It was first entirely subjective, but gradually with practice, she was able to visualize the tulpa out there, like an imaginary ghost flitting about the real world. In time, the vision grew in clarity and substance until it was indistinguishable from physical reality, a sort of self-induced hallucination. But the day came when the hallucination slipped from her conscious control. She discovered that her monk would appear from time to time when she had not willed it. Furthermore, her friendly little figure was slimming down, and taking on a distinctly sinister aspect. Eventually, her companions, who were unaware of the mental discipline she was practicing, began to talk about the stranger who had turned up in their camp, a clear indication that a creature, which was no more that solidified imagination, had definite objective reality. At this point, David Neal decided things had gone too far and had applied different Lamaise techniques to reabsorb the creature into her own mind. The Tulpa proved very unwilling to face destruction in this way, so that the process took several weeks 
and left its creator exhausted. So, you know, she created the thing and then it was like, started to separate itself from her and started to turn evil. And even to the point where other people could see it. So she was like, yeah, I gotta, I've cre- I brought it into this world and I gotta be the one that takes it out. I'll take it out. <laughs> so it defined it as reabsorbing into its own, into her mind. So not necessarily destruction, but so this is where a lot of the more paranormal horror stories come from is you create the creature and then it, it rebels against you and it becomes evil and blah, 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 blah. And then what have you done about release a monster into the world? So can't have a good story without evil. Exactly. Exactly. There's got to be conflict of some kind. Right. <laughs> now let's relate a real Tulpa experience from a real person on how their Tulpa came to be. We will leave the username out for the sake of privacy. I have read about Tulpas for several months and even years. I've practiced proactive meditation and visualization for a long while with mostly good results but I had always thought about tulpas as something quite dangerous and extreme until I found this sub, which has helped me with normalizing my feelings about this thing. Still, I just postponed the tulpa creation because I thought it required profound dedication and wasn't quite ready to it. In any case, last week, I had a fight with my significant other, and in these situations, I feel weak because I've always been somehow lonely. I'm only child, divorced parents, and I'm afraid about splitting up and being alone again. So I took a bath and thought, how could I do if I became single again? And thought about loneliness and how to confront it without having to be dependent on someone else. So somehow naturally, while having the bath, this feminine voice, thought, presence, or person told me something like, Don't be afraid. You won't be alone again. I'll always be here for you. Of course, I knew something about Tulpas beforehand, so maybe that helped, but I felt really relieved. I closed my eyes and started to talk to her, visualize her, called her by her name, which came out as Helena, quite naturally. She was talking to me, and after a while I found myself crying, because she revealed some parts of my subconscious mind that were very hidden, and laughing because she was really witty and cheerful. Anyhow, this person or other being within me kept on surprising me. She's made me found things I was looking for. She's helped me with my career, and we have had conversations. She talks a lot, more than me when we conversate, and I don't feel as lonely as before. But of course, I still have some doubts. Like if I was parodying, even though I don't have to think that much when she talks, and her way of speaking is not as my normal everyday thought stream. She's so mesmerizing that I have even felt some kind of love that goes both ways. She keeps on complimenting me and cheering me up. It's the kind of love feeling of a first love, you know? I don't know. It's been just a week, but at this point, I'm afraid about two things. Number one, to doubt all of this and realize that it's just me talking to myself. A better, more positive version of me, that, for that matter. Because I didn't actually force her or narrate to her that much. We just talk to each other and she talks more. And number two to lose her because we stopped talking for some reason. I guess she doesn't start conversations. I have to call her or invoke her first. Hmm. I like that story. Yeah, so I think I think this highlights uh, the main reason why Tulpa Mancer's site creating a Tulpa in the first place is that loneliness. It's lonely. Yeah, loneliness. Yeah, and which is, you know, extremely relatable for everyone, I'm sure. But yeah, it's so, I think this is a good story because it cites the main reason. And then it seems to show a positive change. I talk to myself all the time, but like in my head, but I don't, I think that, right, you know, this right. is, no, this is, I, I just don't give it a form. Yeah. This is emphasizing that this is different. Like yeah. uh, this Tulpa, it has a different uh, speech voice. pattern than the normal, yeah. one, normal one, a different voice, talks differently, talks more, yada, yada, yada. It also mentions uh, love, which I'm not sure what kind of love it means. I, I'm I'm assuming platonic, but you know, right. you never know. And if it's non-platonic, I would say that that's probably a little bit dangerous to have because you don't want to create a tulpa just to like, and then totally just escape reality. You this kind of like you need to live your real life along with your tulpa as opposed to using your tulpa to get away from your real life that makes sense mm-hmm. but you know we'll just assume the best for him or All her right. and uh we'll move on i guess <laughs> uh-huh. we wanted to include an infamous creepypasta titled 
the Topa. That's what it's just called, the Topa? Yeah, that's a simple title. Oh, oh. Just to include something scary as it seems, everything about Topa Mancy is positive. And too much positivity. Too positive for this podcast. <laughs> I should note that the Topa creepypasta is fictional. But that was too long. But luckily we found an allegedly true story by user Imagine Man on Wattpad.com. And uh, we think it qualifies for spooky stories. Spooky stories. I'm going to tell you about my experience creating a tulpa. Despite occurring a few years ago, I remember it as though it was last week. If any of you are tempted to create your own, I strongly recommend against it. My reasons are explained further on. For those who don't know, a tulpa is an entity created purely through imagination. If you concentrate hard and long enough, you can gradually bring one to life. A human, animal, or something much more creative. It is no urban legend. Tulpas are very real. It can take anything from 200 to 500 hours to complete one, depending on the creator. I was a good few hundred hours into mine before I stopped. I had chosen to work on a replica of myself, purely because it was the easiest to do. When I began, I had no idea if it was going to work. I'm always exploring the supernatural and the paranormal. I have performed countless experiments, and the majority of them have left me disappointed. By the time I started on my tulpa, I was used to being let down. Imagine my surprise when I could feel it coming together, way before I could see anything. It's difficult to explain, but it was similar to the sensation I get when I'm being productive. Except all I was doing was sitting there and staring and concentrating. It began to take shape. At first I could see the outlines, kind of like light on someone's shoulders when the sun is behind them. This gradually bled over until I was looking at a vague figure. Next I defined its general shape, removing any irregularities and filling in gaps. Eventually the tulpa was fully formed and I was staring at a replica of myself. I watched it for a while, admiring my own work. I remember the way it just watched me back, like a customer getting a haircut. By this point, it was like an image from a projector. My fingers passed through it when I tried to touch it. During the next stage of its creation, I would give it the ability to interact with me and its environment. It wasn't long after this I changed my mind about the whole thing. I remember at one point realizing its features were a little more elongated than mine. Slightly longer face, teeth, eyes, limbs, fingers, and there was something incredibly disturbing about the way it watched me. When I first started on it, My tulpa would stay put whenever I wasn't working on it. It always waited patiently in that room for me to return and continue. Then one day I was washing my face and it was behind me in the mirror, staring. I stood there, heart pounding for what felt like hours before I remembered it was still only an image. I swam a hand through it just to make sure. It followed me everywhere around the house after that, but I would never see it walking. It would just suddenly be behind me beside me, in the reflection of something. I began to get very frightened. It all became too much. One night, I decided to stop working on it and just wait for it to disappear. It took a month and a half. A month and a half of watching and following. It was always there, sometimes staring without expression, sometimes smiling with its long teeth. Some nights it would get braver, and I would wake up and it would be standing over my bed, a warped version of myself just waiting for me to open my eyes. Sometimes it would be accompanied by a sour odor. What was even more terrifying was a month or so in, waking up and seeing this faded figure standing at the end of the room like a shadow, still watching. By this point, I was rarely sleeping. Whenever I closed my lids, I could feel its eyes on me. On the nights I did sleep, I would have the worst nightmares imaginable, and it only got worse from there. Picture waking up from a terrible dream, only to realize the nightmare was completely real. I hardly ate. My weight plummeted. 
At one point, my boss asked me to do a drug test. As time went on, the shadow became less and less apparent. The days became brighter again, my nightmares more tolerable. Then one morning, I couldn't see it anymore, nor feel it. The following night, I slept like a log. That's when I knew I was really free. So please, don't mess around with tulpas. I know it's tempting to try it. The concept intrigued me too at first, but I learned my lesson, and thankfully before it was too late. I am just grateful I got out unharmed. Imagine it if I had given it the ability to interact, then try to get rid of it. Its last days would have been much more terrifying. So consider this a warning. If you have a mind like mine, you'll make something dark and regret it. You know what? I'm starting to think my dog is a tulpa. <laughs> yeah. She like constantly stares at me. Well, I think it's because she can't see very well. So she's like, really. That's true. <laughs> so, like, I'll, I have this gate. I have this gate blocking off my room because the dogs here kept going into my room and some of them were peeing on my bed. So I was like, yeah. So I was like, screw this. Yeah, I know. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to gate off my room. So I gate off my room and then Chloe will literally just sit there and stare at me and take her paw and keep hitting the, the gate. And it's so loud and annoying. And she just sits there and stares and then she'll start almost yelling at me. (laughs) <laughs> yeah exactly yes <laughs> like dick go away i know how pugs sound <laughs> that was a very so, good impression actually i'm glad i'm glad i went through this scary story i did my best to read it dramatically and you're like hey that's like my pug yeah <laughs> well no i just kept thinking because he the author kept talking about it just he just f- felt like he kept getting stared at Right, but so I I just want to emphasize that even this story, if this story is true, it's far from a typical Tulpa experience. And to me, it sounds more like a haunting, an entity from the outside, as opposed to one being created from the user's mind. So I think shadow people. Yeah, I think maybe like some sort of like spirit, some sort of evil spirit was just like, yeah, I'm totally a Tulpa. Feed me energy, and then it did, and then it just got kind of out of hand. Um, but I, I honestly don't think this is a true story. It's It reads too much like a story, if that makes sense. It's very similar to Alexander David Neal's experience with her Friar Tuck Monk. Fire, Friar Tuck Monk. <laughs> I, I hopefully, I didn't you know accidentally say a bad word there. But <laughs> <laughs> where it kind of like it was fine at first, but then it turned evil. <laughs> and then... Uh, it also reminds me similar to I've been reading a lot of HP Lovecraft lately just to get more emphasis on it. And uh, I'm actually going to be doing a little uh, experiment for the podcast for come around Halloween. Spoiler alert. Um, yeah. And so it's similar reads to that where it's like, oh, I've I discovered this one thing. So I delved into it and then I regretted it. Um, <laughs> that, that's literally every HP Lovecraft story. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah. I think it was a pretty good story, e- even if it's not true, but I thought this was going to be another one of them episodes that I was like, Ugh. right. Like, where you're just going to have to like drag through yourself through. Cause like, yeah, like for a lot of, you know, 90, 98% of them, I'm, I really get intrigued by after we get, start going, but then there was a couple, I can't, right. I can't remember which ones I, if I saw the episode list, I'd say we you, could probably go back and listen to how you talk yeah, about it. Yeah, and it's like figure it out pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it. Uh, another one for the books. That's it. Yeah. Uh, even though we ended on uh, the spooky story, I think the big takeaway from this episode is that tulpamancy, although a strange practice, seems to be extremely beneficial for its uh, practitioners. Yeah, I know. I'm glad you found it interesting, and I hope uh, yeah. you're listening. Found well, it it's funny because I never, did. ever heard of it. Yeah, never. it's still kind of, it was kind of niche. Like, it was like super niche before 2009, but even after it gained, quote, fame, on online communities, it's still a very niche concept. Like, so there's 33k users in the subreddit, but I doubt all of them are actual Tulpamancers. I'm sure, uh, like, I would say even the majority reading. of them are just like interested in it. So they're right. just like, hey, I just want to read about this. Well, and as you know, my mind wanders, and now I'm thinking plot twist. What if, <laughs> po- what if Pokemon is just oh my god, a bunch of Tulpamancers? Yeah, you know what I mean. Let's let me read this section and then we'll we'll delve more into that. Um, oh. Oh. So just just to get this out of the way, I, I went into this topic because I really wanted to find out more about the origins of the Tulpa concept uh, and explore modern Tulpa practitioners. 
Uh, I definitely did that, but I was not expecting the huge divide between the occult and folk neuroscience tulpamancy. And the vast majority of tulpamancers consider it a psychological phenomenon. So I wasn't expecting that at all. Um, so I definitely learned a lot. I uh, wanted to leave a huge thank you for user Leave the Doors Open on Reddit for answering all of my Tulpa related questions. And you were a great source for this episode. And I hope everyone in the uh, Tulpa community enjoyed it. I always like when people, even though they have a certain belief system or whatever, they're willing to talk to people that might not get it. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I, I think it shows, it shows a lot about that person's personality and, and just respect for their, you know, their beliefs, you know, because if most of the time, if you, you know, you respect your beliefs, you're willing to talk about it, even to the skeptics, you know what I mean? So, yeah, absolutely. So, and that's why I'm, that's what I was really hoping I did with this episode. I, I said, you know, I made a lot of disclaimers and I'd said this a lot because I really wanted to get it right. I really wanted to explain the concept accurately to those who weren't familiar with it, as well as, you know, kind of like paying respects to those who did get it. Cause they are very passionate about this. That's what I really learned from this is they're very passionate about this. I hope if you're listening that it, everything was accurate, if not, definitely let us know and we'll be sure to correct ourselves. But so back to your little Pokemon theory with that, we have some new info as far as supernatural Topomanty goes. Some theorize that many other paranormal entities like ghosts or even cryptids like Bigfoot are actually Tulpas uh, that materialize into existence due to the energy from a great number of people all focused on the same idea. So basically, oh, yeah. so many people believed, so it became a tangible reality. I didn't really Mind have room blown. in this episode. Yeah, right. I didn't really have room to explore that further because, you know, I was focused on, you know, the more psychological side of it. But I thought at right. least mention it. And that's where it kind of ties into Slenderman because, you know, those 12 year old girls killed that other girl in the name of Slenderman. And they th- claim to see Slenderman in the forest and all that stuff. So almost it was almost like a tulpa like entity for them yeah. uh, in fact one of the sources of reading about tulpa that was like literally the first thing they brought up and it was like a, a peer-reviewed paper too so it was like a legit source <laughs> and that's i i really pulled from a lot of legit sources on this one i got did the historical ones i did some more scholarly articles like the samuel viciere and then i got one straight from the source from an actual tulpa answer so I was really proud of that. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, I really want to get this right, but <laughs> I found it really intriguing. I'm glad you found it really interesting. Well. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. So, uh, but now it's uh, it's time for everybody's favorite. Oh yes. part of the part of the episodes, the and that's uh, <laughs> where I beg and plead that you leave a rating on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or where, wherever else you listen to podcasts, and you can leave a review, or even if it doesn't allow you to leave a review, give some stars. You can also leave a Facebook recommendation, as you all know, and I've told you a million times that it helps the show. Five star ratings only, please. <laughs> yeah, if you're if you're part of that Tulpa community and you really like this episode, please leave us five stars because we've yeah. kind of we've kind of reached a, a like a lull in that uh, recently. Uh, but if you really hated it, you know, don't bother leaving a review. Just yeah. email us and we'll you know we'll read it and. We probably won't respond to well, it, but we'll read it. <laughs> and what we've asked you is, is if you leave a low review, please just give a reason. Yeah. Give us a reason why you're leaving a low review. Yeah, because we we have one <clears throat> bad review, and it was a one-star review, and it kind of like hurt us really bad. And I was like, oh, man, nothing. I wonder what he had a problem with. it. He, he didn't have a problem with it, apparently, or at least not one that he was willing nothing. to share with us. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just leaving these guys one star. <laughs> you can follow us on social media. We'd love to hear from you, and uh, we'd love to be corrected. So if we were wrong <laughs> about anything... Yeah, like like Darren said, leave let us know. Not even about this episode, but about any episode. If yeah, you're, any episode. you're an episode and you're like, wait, that's not right, just yeah. send us an email. Uh, we're on Facebook and Twitter as well as Instagram and YouTube. Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube are pretty pretty dead, aren't they? No. I post no? stuff there all the time. I post memes. Well, I haven't been posting memes lately, but I post I always post a gallery for each episode. A picture yeah. gallery. So if you're interested <laughs> in going through each episode and be like, man, huh. I wish I had a visual guide to go along with this. You well, that shows one. you how many times I've gone to our Twitter and Instagram yeah. and YouTube. That's why I run everything. <laughs> All right. Well. Okay. Um, so continuing on with the begging, we are also on Patreon, and you can get some exclusive super secret bonus content like blooper reel episodes and topic voting for as little as $1 a month. Um, I can vouch for one of them blooper reels. One of them is just hilarious. <laughs> They're pretty great. Fun, we yeah. mess up a lot. Huh. Uh, and as usual, if you have a topic suggestion, question comment criticism 
Or if you like have a story you'd like us to share on our Encounters series, please contact us on social media or email us at snipehuntpodcast at gmail.com. Yeah. I'm looking at you, Tobo Mancers. <laughs> yeah. So you guys enjoyed it. And well, Gary's hacking up along over there. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I will. We'll talk to you guys later. All right. Finger see you guns. guys. <laughs> Things are usually substantially more complex than they appear to be on the surface. That is definitely the case for Tulpomancy. This practice has gone from a niche subject of the occult to a wildly popular psychological tool. This episode also goes to show that Tulpas, despite being imaginary friends, might not be so imaginary at all. We wish you and your Tulpas well, and hope you were fascinated by this not-so-frightening folklore. Once again, we want to thank you for listening to Snipe Hunt. Your listening has been noted and will be reported to the proper authorities. All audio used was done so under the protection of fair use. Logo design is by Ethan Rothfuss. The music you heard in this episode was composed by Mayu and Nature World 1986. We'll continue to search for the unexplained and we'll hopefully see you on the next hunt.